Uh, welcome, everyone. It is Wednesday, February 1st, 2017. This is the Aperio Teaching and Learning Call. Uh, I'm Neil Caden. I'm the Sakai Community Coordinator uh, with the Aperio Foundation. I'm one of the three co-facilitators for these calls, including uh, Matt Burgess and Trisha Gordon, and uh, who are with the University of Virginia. And so today, we'll go through our normal agenda process and welcome process. So welcome, everybody. Um, and this session is being recorded. And so, yeah, let's just start off. Uh, welcome to the, to the meeting. We usually start off with project updates and announcements. Um, I pasted in some of the announcements from last times. There have been uh, some updates, which we can uh, also include in the, uh, in the notes. So uh, I don't know if you all saw, but I sent out to the community information yesterday, uh, update on uh, Sakai 11.3, the um, SAMA go test for Sakai, of course, uh, uh, Sakai 11.3, some thinking on Sakai 12, and also the SAMA go extended release feature, which we were hoping to get into 11.3, but uh, from the last time I mentioned that we were thinking about whether to get 11.3 out and not hold up the release based on tests and quizzes, and that looks like the direction it's going. So um, we're going to hopefully get... Uh, the maintenance release out in the next several weeks, a month, roughly, and um, the Samago extended delivery feature we're looking at for Sakai 12. And Sakai 12, we're doing kind of a quick, uh, the intention is to do a quick turnaround in Sakai 12 and pretty much take what's mostly there, plus a few things oh, that may I'm be coming in soon. <laughs> and uh, getting a little bit of background noise from someone, that's our, all right. You may want to mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, so anyway, and Sakai, so Sakai 12, we're, we were thinking from Sakai Camp that we would try and uh, target May, uh, and there's some discussion around uh, um, time boxing it. In other words, just releasing with what, however far we get with Sakai 12 um, in time, so we can release it in May. Versus, there are a number of features we're really hoping to get in, but whether they're all they'd all be ready or not, we're not sure. So that's kind of the update on Sakai 11.3, Sakai 12, and test and quizzes. And I'm curious if anyone has any um, any questions on that, although we're trying to keep it brief. But OK. And of course, questions are always welcome on list and so forth. We had uh, our Sakai camp, which I had a lot of fun at. I thought it was. Uh, really intense. We had um, um, a lot of discussions and more will be coming out about the decisions. Some of them are sort of trickling out. Some of them are related to the release, like you're already seeing. So more will be coming out about the results from Sakai Camp. Um, we had the Farm Lightning Talks, and those went, I thought, really well. And um, those are published on YouTube. I can put the link there, YouTube link for the recording. And Atlas, a reminder, Atlas uh, 2017, that would be a Louisa thing. And if you want to mention any, any update on that, Louisa. Um, hi. Hi. This is Louisa. Uh, uh, Neil, thank you for putting the link there. Um, so very briefly, um, we recently uh, opened the application page. So you can go uh, to the link. Uh, in there, apera.org uh, slash communities slash atlas and download the rubrics application form and prepare for the um, submission. So the close date is March 20th. Uh, we still have uh, plenty of time, but you know, time running fast, running out of fast. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, contact the committee and um, uh, we will all be very happy to help you to uh, improve your application or answer any questions you might have. Uh, on a related note, uh, very glad that we could have the uh, one of the Athletes 2016 winner uh, uh, to present uh, their work in the next teaching learning call, which is uh, stated on the Etherpad. Uh, it's the winner from University of Cape Town. Uh, the topic is teaching introductory statistics using a blended model of instruction. 
uh, at the University of Cape Town. So uh, it was a really great session. Uh, I'm very glad to have him here. Um, his name is Stefan Britz. And um, uh, we will have uh, several rounds of announcement or tweets uh, in the next two weeks. Thank you, guys. Louisa. Yes. That's it. All right. Let's see. I'm just putting a couple notes in there. Um, I, anyone else have any um, updates, project information, uh, questions for the group? before we kind of move into the heart of the, the session today. Okay, well, we will move on then. Uh, we are pleased to have uh, Terry Golightly from Johnson University presenting today on deep linking and branch learning. So Terry, um, I will hand it over to you if you wanna say anything more about yourself and, and uh, uh, share your uh, knowledge with us. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Terry Golightly. I started out at Kentucky Christian University and uh, became a, uh, as we became a member of LAMP even before we were at Sakai. So I was the foundational meetings and all that kind of stuff. And um, this last year, I started working with Johnson University remotely. I'm at home in still in Kentucky and working remotely. But while I was at Kentucky Christian, I was frustrated with some of the design limitations that Sakai was presenting and working with Sakai 10. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with what some of the design limitations were. Um, and when you wanted to structure your learning so that you could break out into weeks, you were either left with the left-handed menu or you put sub-pages on a lesson page and there was no beauty there. There was no aesthetic there. There was not any, really any flexibility. And, <clears throat> and that was frustrating. And I was trying to figure out, I have been in, in one way or another with data entry. I'm not a programmer or anything like that, but I've been working with computers for more years than I care to admit that I'm old. And, um, and I know that capabilities don't decrease with time. So I knew there had to be some answers. And a couple of years ago, Louisa Lee came up with something like this. And I was intrigued. I, I thought, okay, there's, there's a there there. And, um, and I worked with this, with what she presented and what we basically have at the there. Oh, I'm not, I'm flipping the wrong slides. What we basically have there is a top banner that's decorative, that's, that is relevant to the concept and the content of the course. And, um, and yet then we have these functioning buttons at the bottom that lead us to top level pages that function fully as lesson pages and can go wherever you want to go. Um, this, is, this is another thing that you can do with these buttons. At the top there, the green buttons, right? right there, those, that, those contain information that applies throughout the course. So information on a project that they have going on that they can refer to. And what I have on this front page, you've got a, basically a table of contents page and the students land there. What I like to do, but it, you don't need to do it, is hide the home page or the overview page now. Um, hide it all together and this is where the students land and this is where they interact with the course. You can time release the opening of the buttons on the on the individual page so that the button doesn't come open until week six. Um, you can put the information that you want there, but when the student opens the page, they see relevant information that they need each week. This is a course you can you can customize blended courses and that's what this is this is a speech course that um <clears throat> that was a blended course and the weeks that have light colored buttons are in session meetings 
where they actually meet and they have speech presentations and whatnot. And the dark colored buttons signified online work. So they were supposed to um, look at the lecture, read the text and do a paper. Um, so that's that's kind of the flexibility that you have, some of the flexibility that you have. Now, I'm uh, the buttons. I have to apologize. I don't like the way that these fonts are turning out. That's not the way I designed it, but there it is. The buttons can come from any source you like. I generally use PowerPoint shapes. Um, you can use Photoshop or GIMP or whatever, or you can even find things online. The thing I like about doing it with PowerPoint or another photo editor is you can customize it and you can put your dates and you can put content or whatever you want. I have used book covers. Um, subject related photos you have to be careful with the with the accessibility standards and that kind of thing and with with best practices in design not to use just random photos you want your pictures to be related to your content and be relevant you can use any type of a jpeg a png a blah, 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 whatever uh, basically you've opened up your whole universe to having a design element in a sakai site um, good design principles apply. And I would like to remind you accessibility principles apply. And you can put alt text on the button to describe the function of the button so that the screen reader can tell the student that's using the screen reader. Yeah, you, you, and I'll cover the alt text. This is one design that I did. Now I could have used those book covers. Um, the the, start, the layout of the buttons is just um, strung out basically because if you try to put them in a table or something like this, then they, they're not responsive when you go to a small screen. When you have them just kind of loose, it's not a custom CSS, um, it's just loose in there. And so when you minimize the screen or you put it on a, on a mobile device or something like that, they just respond and stack up different ways. It's just done in the editor. So you've got the button put in and a space and the next button put in and a space and the next button put in. You might need to be careful about the size that you let them render. So you're going to make some adjustments. They're just images with links on them. Yes. Um, as far as are they accessibility compliant, you have to make them accessibility compliant. Now the buttons you need to make in order to do this technique, you need a banner button for the top decorative and technically you don't need to put an alt text on that because it's decorative. You need page buttons, the so week one, week two, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you need a return to main page button. And then other course specific buttons such as the project information or group instructions or maybe you've got a course rubric that you want to put a button for. So those are the buttons you need to provide. Now doing this on Sakai 10 is a lot different than doing it on Sakai 11. And the, but Sakai 10 is how I figured out how to do it. So. This is a boring slide for a boring reason, and that's because you need to listen. Yes, you can use the, sec um, the accessibility checkers. That's a whole different topic, of course. You have to listen. Each separate Sakai page has a separate unique URL. And when you go into deep linking, it's involving the use of the individual URL for the target page. How you get to the page for some reason changes the URL. So if you go into a place to get links that involves the index of pages and you see, oh, all my pages are there on the index of pages, you can get into real problems because what you have to do is go to the URL from the page that is your target page. Okay, and we'll come back to that because um, it bears repeating. If you don't, you and the students will end up at the, especially after you've got your second iteration of the course, you and your students can end up in the wrong course. You'll end up in the original course instead of the second one that you're working in. So I've gotten myself tangled up in URLs. Um, 
the whole thing has to be updated. It does not inherit when you go to the next course. So looking in Sakai 10, here's what I do. I've got a lesson page, and I've, this, is, this is the branch learning part, or how you can do a branch learning. The technique is the same whether you're branching off and you've got, OK, choose one of these three plays of Shakespeare, and then the next week, another three plays or whatever. It's up to your imagination. I'm just dealing with the technique. But here's a scenario based on a little folk song. And um, I've got three buttons that represent three choices that the students can self-select. Okay. Now, what happens when I've got these buttons on the lower corner here? Uh, that's what you see on the left. All the buttons are blanked so that the students cannot see what, see them on the left-hand menu because they, they will show up on the left-hand menu. They are top-level pages. When I go into um, the option one page, that which is up at the top here, I want to click on the index of pages. And I'm, this, is, this is a pullout of it. And when I get there, I'll see the option one page here. When I right click on the option one page, I get an, a choice of what to do with these links. And I want to copy the link address. Then I open my text editor. I use Notepad. And I paste the link in my text editor. Look for show page or slash show page and delete everything from that point. This is the unique page URL. Now I'm going back to the main page. I picked up the unique URL for the option one page. I'm going back to the main page. And on the main page, I will open the C CK editor and go to the option one, right click on that to bring up the image properties, go to the link tab, and paste in the link that I just put onto the text editor. And then an important step is to go down to the target button and select same window. If you don't select same window, then you end up opening streams of windows and you don't get back to where you're going. This is the Sakai 10 technique, yes. Now, when you've got these back on your image properties, you've got your alt text box here. And it's really important that you put the function of your alt text box, of, I'm sorry, of your button into the alt text box so that screen readers can pick it up and know what it is. Back on the main page, you want to go to the index of pages because you're going to do your return navigation. OK, so on the index of pages, you're going to follow the same steps. And you're going to pick up for the page, right click on the title of your main page, I always use coursework, and you're going to pick up the same way, right click, copy link address, and put it on your text editor, and, um, and delete everything past slash show page. Then we go back to the option one page, and the return to main menu button, and we link that there. And this gets your, your roundabout navigation. You get to the page, and you get back to the main page. Um, don't pick up the link for the main page from the option one page. You need to pick it up from the main page. Um, faculty don't do this setup, frankly. If they want this kind of navigation, they need to be talking to a designer. OK, just 
just faculty limitations. Um, and, but, but I can see some real applications for this that makes it worthwhile. Um, not just the aesthetic, but if you've got somebody, I've, I've been thinking about this potential scenario, somebody wants to teach a course in Shakespeare. And okay, so the first unit, they're going to choose one of three comic plays that they're going to, you know, and then they each have a course of forums and assignments and reading and blah, blah. Um, yeah, designers can have a hard time understanding it, but Sakai 11 makes it so much easier. It's, it's just, yeah, it makes it a lot easier. But this turnaround, roundabout types of, um, of navigation, you just kind of have to get past the next and back, next and back, and even the breadcrumb navigation and just do it all with the buttons on the page. So for every, for th this technique, you need to do this for every page choice. Every time you have a page like this, you need to have the navigation to the page and the navigation back to the main page. For every iteration of the course, it needs to be redone. It does not inherit. Because the pages are unique, they have unique URLs. If you keep a legacy URL, you're going to end up at that legacy course. So you, the first thing you do when you have a course like this and you uh, import all this content is you have to redo all those links. You just can't reuse them. Now, in Sakai 11, it's a lot easier. You have the same kind of scenario that you want to use, but now the links are in the browser. They're up there, and that's where they are. You don't have to go searching for them. So you copy them from the top browser button, or not button, the top browser bar. And you, and you link it onto the items that you're talking about. Well, so here we have the link for the, the option page, the solution page. We're going to collect that and go back to the main page and put it on the button right there. There's not, a, there's not a separate link tab or anything like that. And there's not a target area. It will do what it needs to do without that. Again, putting in the alt text and clicking OK. And then from the main page, you collect. And I collect it and save it on to the uh, text editor the same way, but you use the whole link. You don't have to delete any part of it. You collect that from the main page, go back to your child page, and paste it into the, um, the return button. So this is just a, an option that you have, and I'm not even going to take up too much time. This is an option that you have that gives you the possibility of using the branch learning, the nonlinear kinds of things that you read about or hear about in a lot of um, instructional design and, you know, try this type of learning and all this kind of stuff. And then and you tend to think, well, Sakai can't do that. It, there's some authoring options that Sakai just doesn't have, but branched learning you can do. It is a little bit intense and labor intensive. Um, you might get a really bright professor who likes to do this kind of thing, but I think that, um, that it's probably usually going to have to go to a designer who can kind of keep those concepts in the forefront where the professor's thinking about his content. Are there any questions I've missed or that you're thinking about?
Thank you, David. It does have good benefits for the students. It's really good. Well, Sakai 11, I just went through the technique, one, two, three, four, it's, it's, it's great. The benefits to the students are you're going to remove a bunch of stuff from the left-hand menu. Now, potentially, there is going to be a whole lot in the left-hand menu, but you're going to hide that from all the students. And the students can potentially have a course that is totally nonlinear, but looks really simple to them and gives them a lot. It's much more constructivist. It's much more, um, it, 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 it can be much more student directed because you're presenting multiple choices to them that they can go through and make choices on. Uh, hi, this is Louisa. Hi. Okay, I don't know why I hear myself. Okay. Um, it's a little bit strange. Uh, is that okay? I talk this way or better change something? I can hear you That's fine. fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Terry, I don't know if there's a technique you tried before. I, I totally agree with you that it's better to create the top level pages, right? Yes. The top level pages. So everything will show up on the left, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, so what I tried is to uh, create those top level pages and then delete them from the left the menu. Uh, so it's totally clean on the left the menu. Uh, so what happens is those lessons pages still in the back end, right? So what you do is you go to a lessons page, then uh, use add a sub page, then you can pick those pages from the back end and you can put it anywhere you want so on the left it's still clean and you can add those pages on a main lessons page okay i'm not does that make sense that. Mm -hmm. that would that would be a, a great add-on it would be mm -hmm. one more you know one more generation removed from any professor getting it yeah, um, and also I tried the new feature, the calling break and the lessons break, uh, uh, sorry, the calling break and the section break in the new 11.2, uh, 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 because now we have a, a, a background colors for those columns. Uh, so it doesn't look exactly the beautiful buttons you created. It's a kind of compromise because many of the instructors, they don't know how to make buttons, right? <laughs> so uh, if they go in there and just go in the settings, uh, change the background color for those columns, the, it can kind of looking like buttons. Have you tried that before? I haven't, no. Mm -hmm. But that's a good tip. Yeah, so uh, because the way that I, I think that this is uh, possibly easier is that those are the uh, lessons pages in the course. If you link using the adding existing pages in the sub page, um, these are not hard links, unique links. They are relative links inside the lessons. So if you transfer the course content, from the old course to the new one, you don't have to relink them. Uh, Dave, does that answer your question? You don't have to replace them next time. Uh, uh, because you're doing it with sub pages instead of top pages? Um, created as a top level, but then when you branching them, you're using the sub page function. Does that make sense? I haven't done that before, so that's okay. that's something I'm going to have to investigate. Uh huh. Um, do we have a couple minutes? So maybe I can show you what uh, how I do it in my lessons. I'd love to see it. It's ten thirty. It's up to Neil. Okay. He's he's moderating. Can, can I do that, Neil? I'm sorry. Can you do? What's the question? Uh, if I could share my desktop. Um, we'd have to make you the presenter and uh, take it away from Terry, at least temporarily. I'm, okay. I, I have finished with my presentation. Okay. But Luisa's uh, got some definite development on it, so. Okay. Um, sure, I've given you presenter permission, so you should I, be able I think to. 
Uh, thank screen. you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see here. Share my desktop. Hmm. I think it showed up and disappeared again. Did the show? Let's see. Um, okay, did you guys see that window pop up? Anybody? No? Not yet. I didn't. Um, okay. You need to, uh, uh, it's several steps to do the screen sharing. It downloads a right. JNLP file. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at it here. Opening with Java. Okay. Okay, now we got it. Okay, very good. Okay, so this is a lessons page I'm working on um, in our training workshops. All right, so if you scroll to the bottom, uh, so I have this four. Uh, blocks a setting a setup so these are the uh column break i use so you can see here if i if i just merge them you can see how i created them uh, so first the, these are just regular set pages right so week one two three four five and six seven eight so i add the column break here all right add a column break then this will be four separate blocks Right. So uh, if you go to the settings for this column, you can make background colors. So if you make different background colors, they kind of look like buttons. Right. So here's another one. Here's the other one. Um, yellow. OK. All right. So uh, it's the uh, it's. Definitely not as pretty as terrorist buttons, it's just a workaround because these uh, pages are relative links. So when you transfer from one side to the other, these all work. Okay. Uh, so, for example, if you create a page on the side, uh, if I go here, not this one. So if I go to more pages, add more page. So if I say uh, week nine and ten all right so this page will go to the left side and you can see it's at the bottom here right so if you want to link it uh, you can actually link it right here uh, if you just go to add content and say add a sub page and you use the existing page all right, so if you do it this way, you can see there's a nine and a 10, you will be a shared page, okay? Uh, usually it's a little bit messy. So what I usually do is that I remove this page from the left side, all right? So if I go to here, click here and say remove page, all right? So then go back to lessons and say add a content and say add a sub page. Choose existing page. So you can see that the uh, week nine and the 10, this page is not currently used. It's just in the back, back end. It's in the file folder. So it's not linked anywhere. So pick this, use a select item. And here we go. Okay, so then it will be an additional uh, uh, page on, uh, here. So I just add another column break. So you can see five buttons here. And then also these are, um, oh, not this one. Uh, these are responsive. Uh, if you use any kind of uh, mobile devices or different sizes, they will uh, squeak, uh, uh, kind of uh, 
squeeze by themselves. So you can see here a little bit more. Uh, it doesn't look as good because I'm logging as the admin. So then a bit more. Okay, so now you can see the mobile view. So they look like this. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's my little demonstration. That's it. All right. Let me stop it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Terry, to give me the time. So, um, so are we, do we have additional questions or discussions? We can always, uh, you know, always segue over to planning future meetings, um, depending where we're at with this discussion. Are we pretty much uh, complete? It sounds like it. Um, if if anybody wants to have further discussion with me on it, um, I I'll leave my email address. Cool. That would be great. Thank you, Terry. Um, so why don't we take the remaining uh, few minutes for the meeting and talk about the upcoming um, times for the teaching and learning meeting? Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, so March 1st, we're holding for an Atlas winner. So hopefully we'll get that one filled also with another Atlas winner um, from last year. And then we have open March 15th, April 5th, and uh, April 19th. So I don't know if anyone has any ideas um, for topics uh, for those meetings. I see the Atlas winter is now February 15th. Okay, it's still showing on Confluence uh, that it's March 1st also is, is Atlas, but we'll get keep it at uh, waiting to get it scheduled. Okay, cool. So curious if anyone has uh, suggestions of things they would be interested in or topics they would enjoy seeing others present or a problem that you have at your institution and we could always see if that that could end up um neil did you see dave's suggestion no i didn't see dave's suggestion a lessons 11 show and tell on a call would that be like a uh round robin kind of thing dave like you know several people okay great when do you want to do that you want to do that on march 15th All right, so why don't you put your names, if you don't mind, round robin demo. If you could just put it in the etherpad. Let's see, I did March, why not? What could go wrong? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you heard about flight, uh, what was it, on Friday the 13th, flight 666. It was out of a Scandinavian country. I think it was Norway. It was H heading to H-E-L. Yeah, flight 666 to H-E-L. It wasn't H-E-L-L. -L. It was H-E-L for Helsinki on Friday the 13th. Everyone got there fine, so. Okay, so yeah, please sign up on the on the Etherpad or let us, let one of the facilitators know. So that's a nice idea. Any other Any other thoughts, any other ideas? I'm curious if there's any uh, idea just that comes to my mind is anything related to open Aperio, um, you know, people wanting to get input or think about um, scheduling some networking events. There will be a Sakai 13, Terry, after Sakai 12. We're not going to skip the 13, I don't think. That would be kind of funny if we went from 12 to 14. I'm going to stop the recording now while we brainstorm so that there's not long periods of silence. Um, so I'm going to do that. So Dave asked if uh, we want to engage folks about the QA process. Yeah, we had some some cool things come out of um, Sakai Camp we're working on to improve the QA process. Thank you, Tricia. Um, I'll mention that on the recording that you're going to do that. Uh, we do need uh, some help on Sakai 11.3, um, so I need to get a test plan together for that real soon. One of the things we're right now we're working on is going through the 
JIRA issues to the test, the ones that are in test and trunk um, to merge them. So ones that have already been resolved, uh, we need to get those tested as many as you know we want and can do. Uh, and especially blockers and criticals. I don't think there's any blockers at the moment. I'll double check that. There are a few critical issues over the next week, basically. Uh, and there's a couple of more blockers, I think, that are getting fixed, uh, like in the next couple of days. And so we'll want to get those tested and merged in, and that way, over the next week, and that way by next Friday, we can get um, our first release candidate out, candidate out for 11.3. And the significance of getting Sakai 11.3 out, there's two things. One, it has over 100 bug fixes, which is really great. But the other significance is the sooner we can kind of wrap up that up, then the more the community can sort of purely focus on on 12 and uh, not as much on maintenance release for, for 11 because we'll have done, you know, three releases and have a pretty uh, solid, We you know, I think we already, with 11.2, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we already have a pretty um, solid uh, product, but uh, you know, Trish is mentioning she's going to send an invite out to the water community community about the lessons round robin. I think that's a great idea, Trisha. I think we should also uh, maybe. I wonder if there's ways we can reach out to the broader community around Aperio, you know, to keep encouraging more Aperio level discussions and not just Sakai. Um, so that's something we might want to talk about uh, in the facilitators or maybe even the community. Um, and and Terry wrote we were going to look at Jira issues during these meetings. Yeah, you know. Uh, that is true, Terry. Thank you, Tricia. Um, uh, that is true, Terry. And and I've actually given that some thought. Uh, it might be worth a couple of minutes discussion since we have it right now. There are a number of issues that are labeled uh, that have a TL label in Jira. It's capital T, capital L, all one word. And um, let me just take a quick look and see how many there are at the current that are not that are still open. And two things I had, um, two thoughts I had about that. Uh, let's, as I do this query, JQL um, labels equals TL and uh, status, not one of the resolved closed ones. All right. We have 37 issues. Let me paste in the J, JQL in case anyone wants to use this in JIRA. So two thoughts I had about that. Oh, oh, right. Okay, yeah, Dr. Chuck, uh, Canvas versus Sakai. You know, that could always be an interesting uh, discussion. Um, so keeping on the TL status thing, um, two things I was thinking about it. One is if this is really, I know we do mostly Sakai on this call, and we have expressed interest in making it more broadly for Perio. Does using you know time specifically for Jira Sakai's on a regular basis does that make it you know feel even more like more of a Sakai meeting versus a Perio? Um, that's just a question. And the other one um, that uh, the other thought I had is that we do have a lot of issues and uh, maybe uh, you know. That's something to think about in terms of having our, our own time specifically to kind of help prioritize those open issues and, and which ones we want to look at. Um, in terms of broadly used, Terry, I mean, it depends on how you define broadly used. And certainly, I think the intention of Aperio is to help bring visibility to these open source projects. So there's broader community uh, participation in general and you know helping them to reach out to a broader audience. So. There may be, uh, I think CAS um, is certainly very broad, but I'm not sure that's really, like what, what's the outcome of that question about being broad, broadly applicable? Oh, I see. Yeah, I guess for, for TNL, right, because it's authentication broadly applicable. Well, I'd say a lot of projects are. Image Quiz, which you've seen presentations on recently, which is an incubation. Uh, Tsugi is, um, I think, very connected with teaching and learning, has connections with Sakai, Karuda, for portfolio management, student success plan. I think there are a lot of Aperio projects actually that are connected to teaching and learning. And the CIPICS thing was good. Yeah, cool. So in my opinion, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, there are some projects like maybe CAS where it's more authentication that happens to come out of higher ed, but is, is not specifically a teaching and learning 
um, issue itself that that you know maybe is, isn't quite applicable. Yeah, I'm not saying we shouldn't do, um, just for clarification, I'm not saying we shouldn't do Sakai-specific things. I was just bringing up that we haven't talked in a long time about uh, wanting to be have a little more cross-pollination and have more Aperio-level um, discussions. So just something to think about. Um, I'm, I'm open. I mean, if we want to, you know, reinsert, sure, sure. Um, I, if we want to reinsert Jira, uh, and I should probably stop recording. Well, I can keep recording it. It's fine. Um, if we want to if we want to reinsert the like the Jira of the week, we can certainly do that. Um, it's just one of those things that takes a few extra minutes for me to think about, unless somebody else volunteers a Jira of the week, um, or you know, we possibly can make it its own own meeting um, if we don't think it fits in very well. So those are just my my thoughts. Volunteer JIRAs are welcome, yeah. In fact, I think it's better if it's a volunteer JIRA than coming from me. Um, that's my personal opinion, but, <laughs> you know. Uh, because I think it shows a little broader community interest. And if you look through that uh, issue list, and if there's things that don't make sense, you could also come back and ask questions about them. You know, like, what does this JIRA actually mean if you're not sure? So if you're not sure about picking one, the other part is could be clarifying JIRAs that have a TL label on them. And you're welcome to assign the TL label um, on any JIRAs that, that you think might be uh, uh, relevant or connected. So that's my little stump speech there. I apologize, I'll get off my soapbox now. and. <clears throat> Stumpy, that's my new nickname for being having stump speeches. As long as it does not subject me to ridicule, I'm I'm fine with it. Well, maybe I'm not. <laughs> I don't know if I am fine with it. So, anyway, so give it some thought. Uh, and I guess also the facilitators, if we have a chance, maybe we can also give that some thought or get some additional uh, input and outreach. So. I guess that'll do it for today, but again, feel free, uh, um, the teaching and learning group, the Sakai users group, Trisha, Matt, Burgess, myself are open, you know, asynchronously 24 hours, not in real time, in real time. But so, uh, uh, you know, feel free to, you know, come up with ideas and, and send us ideas or engage in some discussion that way. So we're gonna wrap up here, but I noticed some questions coming up. Uh, does anyone have a clue on how you're taking care of accessibility in your course design? That would be a cool topic, I think. Accessibility and accessibility in course design, I think would be awesome. Let's see. Uh, so I bet Matt Claire would be willing to be one of the people, but I think if it's accessibility in course design and not just accessibility in general, um, I think that would also be a good one to get uh, volunteers for as well. So thanks for those great ideas. Um, I would motion that we adjourn for today. Thank you, Tricia. Thanks for including a broadcast to the community. And Dave Seconds adjourning for today. So no harm in ending a couple, couple minutes early and give people time for, I'm sure, other busy activities at your local institutions. So thank you all for attending, and I'll catch you next time. And again, thanks to our presenters and for all the participation too.